Good evening, everyone. My name is Phil Foster. Welcome to the Growth Cast, the savage way to take what you want in health, wealth, and relationships. Tonight is episode number 51. It's February 20th, and we have a special guest on tonight, Thor Markinson. How are you doing this evening, sir? I'm living the dream, Phil, just like you, brother. <laughs> awesome. I just want to take a, a few seconds here and uh, let you know that I really appreciate your time this evening and uh, spending it with the, the folks that might listen in tonight, whether it's live or down the road on YouTube. And uh, we are casting on three different platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube itself. And it's just a, it's, it's great to have a guy like you uh, on my channel for the simple fact is, is I followed you on Facebook and we identify, identify with a lot of the things and principles that you live by. And I think you have some valuable information inside of you that maybe some of the gents that might follow along with me have never heard of, you know, heard your information or heard who you were. So I felt that it was important that you definitely stopped by for a visit. So I appreciate you coming in. Wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And it's an honor for, for me to be here with you, Phil. Uh, I just got a chance to look at your website and a little bit about your journey on Facebook. I thought we were just Facebook friends. And then you know, uh, in the middle of the year, you had, uh, and I had uh, talked over the summer after uh, my wife's accident where she broke her neck and was paralyzed. And I really appreciate uh, your help there and support. And lo and behold, here you are, this amazing uh, YouTube personality that's helping men, and especially in the arena of fitness, balancing their hormones and relationships, which almost mirrors some of the things that I have been doing for several years. And, uh, and it's now becoming more and more active. So what an opportunity, Phil. It's almost like it was synergistic. It's amazing the way the universe works. It is. And that's that's an, an amazing statement right there in itself, because we do definitely follow those same lines. You're into fitness as well. You work with the older gents, uh, gents that have been in the game for a little bit, and then as well with the hormones. You know, in helping men, I think that is that goes without saying. A lot of the things that you promote and believe in, I mean, if you go to your website, folks go to your website, becomingadurableman.com, right? Becomingdurable.com. That's what you're all about. And I have some talking points here that you had sent over. And uh, basically, uh, Thor has got quite a repertoire. Um, this gent right here, are you comfortable with me sharing a little bit about it? Oh, absolutely. Man. All of it's true and, and verifiable. So absolutely. Perfect. So Thor, he works with a lot of folks, uh, obviously in, dealing with the electrical grid, obviously he's the electrical guy, right? So it's just a 5,000 volt power lines and working at heights of 500, half a million brother. Okay, I right, right, right. Flies the helicopters. <laughs> yeah. So, and so you fly the helicopters or are you uh, actually uh, on the skid? I'm the guy that jumps off onto the lines. Yeah, man, dude, that takes some nuts right there. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if I could hang with you <laughs> a little bit too hardcore. <laughs> So uh, in through doing that, uh, that's I, I'd like to talk about that first, Thor, and I'd like to understand how you became Thor, or RP Thor, as they can find you on uh, uh, Instagram. How did you become like that, uh, this individual, this gent that's interested in helping men through that job? I think that's a good start, a good place sure. to start. Absolutely. Uh, for those that don't know me, let me just give a brief background. Um, my name is really Thor. I was born with the name Thor. In my family, they descend from uh, uh, Northern European, Norway, Iceland, as you can probably tell by the last name. And uh, a lot of the men in my family have the same first name, which is Mikael. And, and then we go by our middle names, minus Thor. And I've gone by Thor all along. Hated it when I was a kid here in America. I was born a year before they came out with the comic book and it became quite popular. So I, I had to deal with the abuse and the bullying, which I wouldn't trade for anything. It made me tougher as a man. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting when you have a, a name, you almost have to live up to it. So that's another story. But at 59 years old, I've, I've seen a few things. Um, I got involved in, in the trades rather early. I was very bored with high school, and I graduated at 16. And as a gift, I had two fantastic parents. My father might as well have been Odin. Uh, sent me to Europe for three months <laughs> at 16. To learn a little bit about life. And I'll tell you, the last two and a half weeks without money, I learned a little bit about life. <laughs> you know, that's uh, that middle name right there, Thor. That is a big one to live up to, right? You know, and and so a little bit about Thor, you know, and understanding who he is. Uh, he's been married for 30 years to his lovely bride. And uh, they've got four children and 10 grandchildren. So you've been around for a minute. 
So you're an authority when it comes to what long-term relationships and some of the things that you discuss with men and helping them navigate what's going on in today's society when it comes to relationships and who they are as men. And go ahead. Well, I could certainly tell you what works for me and, and some of the people I've coached and consulted with, um, you know, based on experiences and, uh, and, and uh, not that I'm a superior expert, but I do have 30 good years under my belt and I have some clients that have had over 20. So yeah. And uh, it can be an amazing thing to have a successful marriage. Now, let, let, let me get this right. I don't support state marriage at this point, And I haven't for a long time. My wife would support me on that, but I do support what is called ceremonial marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, and what that actually is, is everything except the state involved. And I actually have recommended to clients that wanted to go this route, they, they, they actually write their own wedding vows, such as I did when I got married. Not to copy somebody else's, but write your own. It's much more valuable. It's much more long-term. And it sets the stage for success. But more on that at another time. Yeah, and I like that idea, right? And with the state not being involved. And I guess what the... Uh, with today's society and where things are going, it's, it seems almost natural, almost evolutionary, correct? I mean, when you start looking at what's going on with the divorce rates and mm. what happens um, in uh, divorce court, for instance, you know, I'm an anomaly. A, a lot of the, the gents that follow me and or who know me, they know my story and what I've been through. And they, they will definitely, I can definitely assure you that I am an anomaly, but most guys, they really get kicked. And so, you're saying just a ceremony between the man and a woman is good enough, and and there's nothing nothing else that's needed. No, I mean you you can obviously dress it up as necessary, but yeah, there really is nothing else necessary. Uh, particularly when you're making that commitment from your own heart, you're drawing your own vows, whatever they may be based upon. It is a covenant between you and the universe and your wife. So that's really the important part, not the state part. Now. In days past, you were offered incentives to be married and stay married. Those were long, long gone. You're actually incentivized to marry and to divorce. That is the incentive today. It is everything is stacked against you from the court systems to uh, social, social media to television. Men are portrayed as comedic caricatures of what men should be. The way we communicate, we are being trained at an early age for the last 25 years to debate as a form of communication. You can watch this in any sitcom, any newscast, any open talking head show. It is debate. When a man and woman speak, it is not a normal conversation. It is adversarial as if two men were debating, and this has been made normal. So you take that, you couple it with today's society where it's tough enough to have to make a living and you almost both need to work, and you're both out alphaing each other. I hate the term alpha, but just to, just to use it as illustration, and uh, it, you end up having these stressors, and all of a sudden, you know, the woman will see a way out because she loses attraction. You know, uh, complacency sets in. It's easy for a man to lose attraction because once he has that gal, you know, he has grabbed the brass ring on the merry-go-round, Phil. Yeah, absolutely. It's easy to get fat. I mean, I've got I've got the cow and the milk's coming in for free. You know, what <laughs> what more do I need to do except drink it? That's not how it works. You know, thank God for um um hypergamy because it keeps me on my toes. I I thank God for it because it makes me a better man every, each and every single day. Because if I don't, I know what happens in about six to eighteen months. I've experienced it. I know what happens when the attraction leaves, and then the death knell comes in. You get contempt. When contempt arrives, you're in deep, deep trouble. Oh, because yeah. Everything is stacked against you at this point. When you're sitting there having a conversation with your wife, you have beautiful kids. And as a man, you've been blinded yourself. You got wife goggles on. You don't see it. You're idealistic. And then you look ahead and you say, honey, look, the sky's blue. And she snaps at you and says, it's not really blue. It's a, it's a deep gray purple color. You got a big fucking problem. The big and one. <laughs> if that's the conversation, you got a big problem. So, and then you go to counseling, mm -hmm. marriage counseling. If anybody yeah. knows the history of this and where it came from in the twenties, I will just tell you this, look it up. It came from a eugenicist. Okay. It's an amazing thing. And it is stacked against you. It is literally a feed point. 
for the system. Oh, it and, is 100%. It is not your friend. I've experienced it myself. So you've been married 20 years. You're going to counseling and the wife and you are being counseled. There are secrets being held. Mm. And uh, basically it's a sounding board. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've got this person who is the expert that's never been married before giving side counsel. Girl, you need space. Move out for a little while. Get some space. Find yourself. And you'll be truly authentic then. Oh, yeah. Do you think that works well? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. My, my I realize person. I am actually the space for many. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bad deal. And it just feeds the system over and over. And the reason it's such a bad deal is because the way the way our nature is, is that as, as women age, it's harder and harder to find the ideal for them to truly be fulfilled in a relationship. For a man, man, if they're, if they're sexy and available, it's about it. And then they might consider loyalty and some of the other, other, other things for longer term. It's not nearly as long a list and difficult of a climb. And there's reasons for that. There's nature's reasons for that. So I do have sympathy for where these poor gals put themselves in. And they can't help it because women are heavily influenced in, in today's environment. The, the demographics show it. They're being taught, Phil. For the last 25 years, get an education. Great. Go be a man and compete in cube world, at least until you're 30. Yeah. Then you can marry and settle down when the baby rabies hit. Here's the problem. Using Pareto's distribution principle and curve, you look at the demographics. Here you have a woman that's over 30, say 30 to 30 to 40. Okay. Mm. Let's be fair here. That's a geriatric pregnancy. If you were to marry and have a child. And the problem with that is only about 17% can actually successfully conceive at that point and have a child. It's staggering. Enough. It's just enough. So the, the exception principle comes into play and every single gal that is 30. So I know somebody that had kids. It's not a problem. I do. They can do it. I can do it. Yeah. The reality is you just stacked 80% of the odds of having a successful pr pregnancy against you. And it declines from here on out. But you see the exception. So you think it's the rule. And it's almost like a damn conspiracy. And our demographics have now slipped to 1.4. We are losing population at this point. Our bodies aren't built for this. So there, there, there's a lot of challenges to relationships today, many of them. And here's the problem. The fulfillment and success in a, in a good relationship is immense for the women and for the men. We're better together than apart. And if you've seen a woman that's had a good, strong, successful relationship admires her husband is proud to be a part of that they are vastly more fulfilled in life i would agree with that statement and i wanted to circle back real quick i know you don't like the term alpha but you know out alphaing that that is that is a, a, like competing almost and i see that a lot in today's society um you're absolutely correct on a lot of the things that you said there and um you know, and like I had alluded to you before we went live and, and everybody else knows as well, I went through a nasty divorce and part of the, part of the piece was going to marriage counseling. Okay. And, and believe it or not, that marriage counseling was offered to us free through our insurance. Oh, yeah. You know, that's it. So it's even more so, okay. And, and so we go to, we go to counseling Thor and basically, uh, you know, the, the, the issues were never resolved. Okay. And, and so it, the guy looks at me and he says, okay, well, I'm done with you and you stay. And he told my wife to stay in there and sure enough, you need time apart. And it was one of the best things that could ever happen to me because once uh, I went through that situation with her and I knew that I had left everything as best as I possibly could, it was a done deal. I filed for divorce, but I think you're on, you're onto something there, uh, that competition, right? Women, I don't think need to compete with their men. I think they need to support their men. And I think that's why a lot of people are in the situations they're in these days. Um, and, and I, and I will tell you, I have a very difficult time, especially I live in the Dallas Fort Worth area, uh, Thor, it's a huge Metroplex and it's hard to find other couples or other people in relationships that have the same common view, so to speak, that, you know, all things flow through the father first, you know, mm. I don't, I don't have to ask my girl, Hey, I'm going to go do this. I just go and do it. Hey, this is where I'm going. See you later. You know, yep. it's, it's interesting to me how men have been degraded. Okay. into to the point to where they're almost children now. And, you know, you're right. Absolutely. Uh, what you were saying earlier about the, uh, the sitcoms and how men, you know, like the Peter Griffins, you know, obviously it's, it's everywhere in almost every sitcom. They are 
men are treated like children now. Mm. Okay. And, and, uh, they have been out, uh, they've been out alpha on TV, 100%. Yeah. And so it's no wonder, uh, some of the things that you were saying about statistics and the way we are losing, you know, what'd you say that we were actually, we do not have, we are, ha- we are have a lower birth rate now, correct? Is what yeah, you're demographics. And, and just so you know, alpha is okay. It's kind of an abstraction. I think it's much more nuanced. I'm okay with using it for illustration purposes. Um, but uh, I really am because it does help a lot understand these these uh, these situations and circumstances. But yeah, the demographics that's happened in the last 25 years is stunning. We're seeing data now that's uh, really interesting, but there are consequences, Phil, for every woman that is born for us to maintain our current population. 2.4 babies must be born. Every single woman. Okay. Right. So in the 60s, 2.6 were being born. They freaked out and said, oh, my God, the population is going to kill us all. We're going to have too many children. Mm -hmm. Worldwide, it has now fallen below sustainable replacement averages. Japan is 1.1. China has fallen below the 2.4. America is 1.8. So 1.6 to 1.8, I believe. And so what's going on? You know, we're going to lose population. That's, that's going to be pretty serious. And on top of that, that has serious consequences to our financial system, Mm -hmm. to our politics. You know, this, this can put a lot of stressors because there's not enough people to sustain the social programs that we have. What do we do about that? Yeah. There's a lot of insolvency in our future as a country for sure. Yeah. And the, and the sad thing is, is in reality, I mean, I believe I was looking at these statistics and at the time uh, uh, of the writing, which was a couple of years ago, I think in Texas, there was uh, something close to 7 billion acres. So if you took every person on the planet, each person would have one acre if you put them in Texas. That's amazing. <laughs> so do we have a population problem? Yes. We're shrinking. You know, we're, we're, we're not having a good one. So... Um, and yeah. so like, and so like, does that line up with like, what the heck's been going on with us as a, as a nation, as a world, as, as a people across the world for the last couple of years, um, with this thing, I don't really acknowledge what it is, but you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories out yeah. there that say, Hey, that it was, it's designed to depopulate us, you know, the, the injections or whatever. And, uh, it's, but if we already are on that track and we are doomed to fail, then so as men, what is a good suggestion to combat that, to go the other direction? How can we f- rectify that as men? Well, first of all, a lot of conspiracies ended up being true by proven by history. And I don't know, I don't, I'm not privy to any information, but it's certainly, you know, through policies and public policies, at least on the depopulation thing. And, and, you know, the green environment, we're taxing literal air you're breathing. It does appear as though there is a severe, there is a conspiracy to depopulate uh, at least the rural areas and concentrated into the urban areas, at least that much. Um, So what do we do about it? I mean, I think there's going to be a ton of opportunity here for uh, men in our space. I mean, men come into our space and they're really interested in having sex right now. What was it? uh, Young men between 18 and 30, is it 32% are sexless? I couldn't even imagine. Um, That's a, that's, that's double. That's almost triple from what it was just five years ago. You see? Yeah. But it's not that way for the ladies, you know, because they're all competing on the world sexual marketplace right now. And here's the thing, you know, guys, you, you don't, you can be average, just be just 10% above average. And the opportunities for you to mate is, in, is in incredible. Now, a lot of guys will get out there to learn to be players because game is not hard to learn. Uh, you can learn to be attractive. You can actually establish a real authentic identity for yourself. Study hard, work hard, work on yourself, and become somewhat stoic achieve your goals as a man and you will become more and more attractive and you actually have interest from the majority of females. And uh, so I, I think it's, it's, it's good for men, but here's where they fall down. You know, they get that abundance mindset and after a certain amount of time, it's a lot of work maintaining. And there's, there's definitely benefits in having a long-term relationship such as a ceremonial marriage. 
you have children, you support a legacy. I mean, here we are, we enjoy ourselves and we're gone. What's left? That's if you it. look at history and demographics, 40% of men have been able to pass their genes on. That's it. It's incredible. What happened to the rest? Dead end, brother. Yeah. And so, I mean, in the universe, we only have two drives. If you boil it down, survival and procreation. And men and women are better together. There is so much to be said for having a relationship that lasts a long time. And I'm acknowledge all relationships are temporary. I'm not an ideologue. Uh, but within those relationships, you can have amazing moments every single day at some point or when. But for now, you know, you, you can get a lot. You can build an empire together with your queen. Uh, and I think a lot of men in our space really do want that. Publicly, they may not say that, but look behind the scenes. And the guys that don't struggle, they struggle with it as they age. You know, what am I leaving behind? Who am I? You know, they're not getting that support system that was built for us, which is a female by our side or two <laughs> or three. <laughs> yeah. And that's interesting, right? Because, uh, you know, circling on that a little bit with the red pill community and, and guys that are, you know, they come to the men's side of Twitter. You know, I found RP through Twitter. I didn't really find it through, uh, I found it through Twitter and, um, you know, those guys are pretty, they're pretty wild over on that side, on that social platform when it comes to it, you know, obviously Reddit as well. And, uh, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of twisted takes though, unfortunately. And when, when new guys are just figuring out, okay, I'm completely screwed here. What do I need to do to straighten out? Okay. How do I have sex with my wife again? Mm -hmm. you know, they put this in and boom, there's Reddit, there's, so and so, I mean, I think like this guy right here, the family alpha at the family alpha.com, he was a big uh, Reddit poster and he's done some blogging as well. And I think one of his articles is like keyworded now because of the simple fact is it's like, you know, how to turn her into your slut, you know, That's so, right. yeah. sure. <laughs> and, oh, there's uh, lots of that. I mean, you don't just come born with that knowledge. No, and that knowledge is crucial. I'm going to say it and I'll say it here and I hope it's not a problem. When guys will tell me all the time, and this I, exactly you said, a dead bedroom from the wife, how do I get her back? That's the biggest part of my consultations. There are ways to do it. However, that being said, it's really important when you get past that six months of dating because once you've done that, there are behaviors and traits that you need to be aware of when the honeymoon phase is off. Mm, when it's not so sparkly. When you get to sniff her farts and see her warts, <laughs> you know. And if you can get past that part right there, you can actually start conditioning her to be the wife that you always wanted. And she will be happy to do so. This is not something that you do as a malevolent dictator. Not at all. It's not done that way. Mm -hmm. It's done subtly and over time, and they're happy to do it. It's, it sounds horrible. I'm conditioning him like a dog. I'm using operant conditioning. You are. <laughs> but um, you're the leader. You're expected to do that. That yeah. is what you must do. Uh, and you, and you can see that done throughout history and even the Bible, you can see this and to great success. Um, we're built that way. You know, and a lot of guys, they don't want to face that because it's uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable truth. And that's, uh, you know, I think that kind of goes along with when these guys, they come to the, you know, the, this side of Twitter or wherever they find it, uh, to find this information, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of skewed information. There's a lot of bad takes. I share the same sentiment into having a long-term relationship with somebody. I share that same sentiment of, okay, when I build my legacy, you know, my queen is there with me. You know, she is a big piece. Like it, it, we're all over social media together. We go to public events together. Uh, a lot of people in on social media have met my wife, seen us together. And it's important because she is a key component to what I am building. Uh, if I was to be gone tomorrow, she would have a pathway to carry my my legacy on, you know, as even though it's young and it's just really getting going. And I want a lot of guys to understand that uh, when you're figuring these things out, when it comes to your woman and conditioning her like Thor was talking about earlier, um, it's basically just letting you have to establish, I would call boundaries early and often, and then reinforce those boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to call it like you see it. So many guys are afraid of their women and then they lose more respect for them. It just dries them up even more. Okay. I always tell people that I come in contact with when it comes to my wife and she's listening to this stream right now and it's all good. You know, the, the moral of the story is if I don't put her on the roller coaster every once in a while, she's going to put me on the roller coaster. 
Sure. You got to have a little bit of fun with it, you know, at the same time, but understanding that when you are conditioning your mate to your liking, they are completely a good woman that wants to be with you. It definitely wants to share in your mission and do the things that you want to do in life will support it. And then, and, and then take it right up. And I think that has a lot to do with their mating strategies and who they are as people. You know, they really want a guy to lead them. Unfortunately, in this day and age, uh, most men, they fail to lead. I mean, you can go anywhere. You can go to, you can go to a grocery store and 95% of the, the dudes are walking behind the woman. They're pushing the shopping cart. They're being led around the grocery store. It's, it's incredible to me. It's backwards. Everything seems to be upside down and backwards. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I think that when people, and this is what I was trying to say a little bit earlier, is, you know, I have a very difficult time, you know, you know, when I come in contact with people that really don't live this kind of lifestyle, understanding, okay, well, how do you guys live and operate like that? You don't, you know, and, and, and it, you can just see like the blank stares. And you okay, can almost. Almost, once you start the path, it's seemingly effortless. Once you start the path, the hard yes. part, like you said, boundary enforcement that guys, they can barely lead themselves to begin with. And if you can't lead your, if you can't rescue yourself, you certainly can't rescue her or lead her or in any way, shape, or form. There is, something to be said about a woman, her emotions and her feelings that we will never describe as a man. And a part of that, you know, she, cr she creates these little humans inside of her and she needs to be protected and secured. We will never know exactly what it is when she has secured in the hind part of her brain that she is with the best, most solid rock of a man that could protect her in any circumstance that there is out there the level of fulfillment that she gets from that is almost not we're not able to put in words and comprehend and you can see that on them when they actually achieve that right mm -hmm. and it, when we set boundaries just expect them they will be broken by not only her but you oh, and yeah. you be prepared to deal with it and i'm pretty harsh when it comes to forming the relationships i put the guys through quite a bit because i actually make them uh and i make them have a escape plan because if they talk about it and have an escape plan up front, it's not that you're predetermining it. It's that you're getting those unknowns out of the way so that you can be successful. Mm -hmm. And you don't take away her ability to be a human and depend on you. She still needs to be a human being and have some of that uh, capabilities, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need to encourage that within her. So it, it, it's just smart to do that. There's a lot of details behind it. But um, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, when you have that fire in all cylinders, it's it you haven't it seems completely effortless, and yet it's not. But it it seems that way even when you're in it, and that's where it leads to complacency, guys. Yeah, I've already made it. <laughs> yeah, it's that what's that whole arrival thing, right? They've arrived and it's all good, and then they let themselves go, and then there we go again. And I think a lot of guys they're they're confused on that one as well because um, once they get into that position with a woman. And they do get comfortable and they lose it again. They get a little frustrated. They fall back into that anger position, I would say. And um, I think most guys would do well to focus on themselves first and then the woman will come. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of times where uh, you can tell in a relationship with two people where, you know, boundaries are set, expectations are met or not met. And, um, Okay. Does, does he continue to let that behavior slide? Does he continue to uh, tolerate that, that disconnect from that woman, you know, and, and it, especially in the red pill community is because they're, they're kind of, they're incompletely, they've incompletely finished the process of coming out of that comfort phase or coming out of that conditioning of, Oh, the woman first and, and putting themselves first. It's interesting to me when I see guys go through that and it's like a loop, they just kind of, they get there and then they go right back. And I've seen it yeah. over and over again. And some of the biggest dudes that we see on, on, on social media in this, in the men's space that talk a good game, boy, they are, they are, they're owned. It's incredible to me. It really is. It, 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 uh, it kind of, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, I, I, cause I, I don't know. I've, I've counseled some. So, um, it's an easy trap to fall into. It's an easy trap to fall into. Uh, and, and this red pill, a lot of this red pill information works so well. And you can kind of get carried away with it if you're in an LTR and you can do some damage, people. 
uh, because a lot of it's unflattering. They don't want to know about it. They just want you to do the right things, you know, lead the relationship, learn to lead. It should almost be invisible to her and you're going to do just fine. You know, but we get all excited about this information. We start sharing it. And of course it's unflattering, you know, and good Lord, if you share it at work, you're going to, you're going to hear from HR. <laughs> yeah, you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and some of the things that I actually teach and, and counsel on do sound very unflattering because there's no other way to, but it's meant, the communication is meant for men. And so it's important. If I was to communicate this to women, it would be a lot longer and I would have to use a lot of feelings to get there and make it, you know, important to them. Uh, and I do, I, I mean, I have some female clients, but um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I know what you mean in this space. It's, uh, it's exciting. It's, it, it's, it's wonderful when you're experiencing it, but there are pitfalls. And of course there's, there's a lot of guys that are making a living doing this right now too, because it's so needed. I mean, I, I know some guys get at each other and, 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 talk bad about each other, but I don't really think there's room for that. I mean, I think that a rising tide lifts all boats in reality. Yes, and you look at the number of guys that have been raised by single moms, bless their hearts, you know, they're good little boys and they are today. They're still kind of teenagers and don't have emotional regulation mm -hmm. that they need to, to survive as men and be attractive. And therefore, you know, the sky's the limit for us. And, and I do all of this for myself, really. When I was teaching power line work, teaching guys to be safe and not blow their arms off and fall off a helicopter and get killed, you know, 30 or 40% of what I was teaching was life skills, you know, how to, how to, you know, regulate their emotions so they could stay alive at work. And it, it translated directly into their personal lives. And I've heard from these guys over the course of their careers. And it's, it's quite fulfilling for me as if I'm a pseudo dad and have helped these guys. And it's, it's, it's an amazing thing to pay forward phil um and i'm sure that you feel that with, with what you're doing here you wouldn't have got into this if that wasn't a part of it uh, yeah. and, and of course you know we got a pair of bills and that's and it's not worth it if if guys don't have skin in the game and that's why we charge for these things mm. uh but uh it is quite rewarding in and of the same i do it for myself i'm quite selfish that way yeah you know and that's uh you know with the fitness basically you know, I, I really love everything about fitness. I'm, a, I'm I'm into it big time and I love watching guys improve. You know, and I think fitness obviously is a big piece of, of helping a guy straighten himself out. You know, when, when you can knock some weight off of him, build some muscle that, you know, his his self-esteem comes back. And that's that was my personal experience. Kind of like I told you when I went through my nasty divorce, you know, I was alcoholic sick, fat, you know, I was, all you got to do is go to my YouTube channel and look at the intro video. I mean, I put a picture of what I used to look like up there, man. I went from in shape to fat and sick back to in shape again. You know, I turned away from it and it's interesting to me. It's kind of like this gent right here is uh, eternal light says I'm changing my life. Thanks to RP eating, right, lifting and learning how to make money. Mm. And, it, and it's, and when you, when you see stuff like that from guys that those are guys right there, I think that are getting it because he's focusing on himself first. You know, you can't, you can't lead a woman if you can't lead yourself kind of like what you said earlier in the stream. And, um, and fitness is so much a big piece of this, you know, once these guys start getting some self-confidence and, uh, start leveling up their finances and they start leveling up who they are as human beings and how they interact with people. I think that is where the money's at for these guys. Yes. Uh, and, and, and see, I think that's missed a lot, unfortunately, because it's like, okay, well, you know, you're having chick problems. We'll go approach a hundred. Okay. Well, that's fine and all, but are we addressing the issues of what these guys are dealing with? Are we dealing with what the problem is, right? What is the problem? Low self-esteem, you're weak, you're fat. Um, you don't have any self-worth, you know, and how do you correct that? So my point in this whole discussion, you know, when we, we talk about red pill and having a relationship with women, or if you want multiple relationships with multiple women, that's your point. That's your choice. You know, the thinking is fix yourself first. And a lot of things are going to be a lot easier. You know, when, when guys f start biting the hook at the red pill theory or, or changing their lives, you know, it's it, when they start to let go of who they used to be and become the, the new version of themselves and improve that version, 
uh, it's, it's amazing to watch these guys do that, you know, and, and do I monetize my training? Absolutely, Thor. That's, it's not necessarily how I pay the bills because I'm just starting this business right. out, right? you know, but it's a, it's a great thing uh, to be a part of when I see these guys doing this. And it's, you know, in my men's community, I see the changes in these guys weekly when they pop in there. Well, it's important. I'm, it's not valuable to them unless skin's in the game. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting, you know, when the skin is in the game and you charge them a little bit of money, they, they definitely start really getting after it. And, um, I think most men, uh, in this day and age, they have lost all self-respect for themselves. As a matter of fact, most men have, and it's a sad thing for me to see. And so you see a guy like myself, I'm almost 50 years old, a guy like you, I mean, we could go out and crush half the town easily, you know, because the simple fact is, is we're on point. So how do men get to that level? How, you know, if you're a younger guy and you're, and you're just starting your journey, what are some good thoughts for these younger guys? What do you have for these guys? What's, give them some secrets, Thor, that you have oh. inside of you, man, to, to kind of guide them to the right direction of, of biting this hook of red pill theory or self-improvement and getting better. I'm going to give you a, one of the greatest tidbits out there. Now, I'll tell you, you touch on the deepest part. Red pill is the starting point. What's really going on here is guys have a tremendous problem with their inner game and their inner monologue. It's bombarded constantly by outside sources and dopamine hits. This is pretty amazing. What is the key to this and what am I going to offer? It's just going to be brief and we can go into this in more depth later, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to break it down like this. Everyone needs validation. Mm -hmm. And what we are stuck with is external validation with the media, with others around us. And what we need to, by doing that, by getting external validation, we're seeing our value and our worth. And, you know, we get addicted to that. And then self-validation is where we really need to get to. And how do we get there? We get there by becoming men, rites of passages, by becoming better. This is something amazing. You see this with the ladies mostly. They seek external validation constantly. I, I put it like this. Um, external validation is relatively easy. It, it, you know, it's delayed, but it's that delayed internal validation that you get, that self-validation that's so important. And what am I saying, Thor? It's like this. The external validation is like a battery. You get a battery, it's full of current, it's full of electricity, and you get to use it, and you use it, and it's fantastic, and then it's gone. I can recharge it only so many times. So it's like this. I go on social media as a woman. I post my pictures. I get this validation. Men are giving me attention. This even works with men too. Men need validation too. So where do we get it? We get on Call of Duty and we become a hell of a sniper. God damn it. I can blow those guys away. Watch the shit. I can yell. I can express myself. And that's my external validation. That's the battery. I keep buying these batteries, man. Yeah, I can get big gel packs. I can get little gel packs. I can get a Tesla, but I got to keep recharging. I got to keep going back to the well, right? Mm. What is self-validation? Self-validation is the very next step, and it's the most important one. It's the hardest and takes the most work. Mm. It's like a generator. It can either be like a little pocket generator you put gas in to get that electricity and power, or it can be a big diesel motherfucker that produces 10,000 kilowatts. Each one needs maintenance. It needs fuel. You have to feed it fuel. You don't have to do that with batteries. No, you got to feed this with fuel. You got to change the oil. You got to have a starting procedure. You got to change the air filter. These are all things you have to do to yourself. But when you do, not only can you self-validate, when you do this enough, the external validation, those batteries start coming at you without you seeking them out. And guess what? You can charge those batteries. And you can throw them back out into the world. It's an amazing thing. So self-validation is an amazing thing, and it's part of emotional control. When you can regulate your emotions, you have command of the world. Because you see, if you're really honest with yourself, we don't control anything. Externalities, internalities, none of that stuff is controlled. The only thing that we control ever is our thoughts and our emotions and our perceptions. And that's it. And we choose how to deal with them to you know, interact with the outer world. So that's probably the deepest thing I could throw out there. That's the most important. And the red pill is just the starting point. Your physicality, if you're able to be physical, it is the very basic thing you have to do. Put yourself in a position where you get comfortable being uncomfortable. 
because that's what it's going to take to build a generator to self-validate. Yeah, man, that was deep. I like that analogy though. If you think about that, you know, you can, you fuel and maintenance your generator and then the batteries come to you. Mm. That is cold, man. That is cold. That is a cold right, one. Right there. <laughs> if you think about that for a second, you know, that is a very, that is a, that is 100% a fact. And I think that's, uh, that plays into why a lot of the relationships are the way they are. It's interesting. You know, if you get on social media, I mean, I'm all over it, you know, and you see guys, that have accomplished something great. Like they've, they've graduated college or they've started a new business and they might only get like, you know, a couple of hundred likes or 20 likes. And you see a girl and she's just an average girl and she's in some fitness gear at the gym and she'll get like 20,000 likes. Mm -hmm. It's in crazy. It's crazy to me um, how uh, convoluted women have been. And, and this is, I'm probably going to get some heat for this and it's okay, but their, their brains have been blown up by this external validation from, from thirsty men. And it reinforces it because these, these young gals come away with, I need a man that worships the ground. I, I, I walk on completely unhealthy and will destroy just about every part of her life, including herself. And yet she has this machine that is telling her that is the way to go. It is incredible. The thirst, the thirst is real. Oh, it is. <laughs> There's some thirsty ones out there. I agree with you, Thor. And that's, you know, like uh, if you go on any of my streams, that's what I call these. I call these the devil, man. <laughs> these, are the, these are the devil, bro. They come there. It's coming at you for the dopamine, you know, and, and, oh, yeah. and, so, and I think that, um, you know, I never really thought about video games for guys, but you're right. I guess a lot of dudes, they do play that. You know, everybody I come in contact with really doesn't play video games. We're all too busy, but yeah. um, the younger gents for sure. Right. I guess there's a whole generation. And then, you know, so seeking that, that think that, about it. Doesn't have to be that, but the, the example for that can also be. Think of it this way: You've been in corporate America ever? Um, no, sir. Okay, let me let me say: You can be in that cube farm, and you can play that game in corporate America. And what happens to people there? And there's studies that's been done on this. Almost almost two thirds of everybody that plays that game in corporate America lives on that job description. It becomes their identity. I will tell you this, that's an unhealthy fucking place to be for men and women. Their identity is what I am an analyst, three senior executive assistant. Yeah. It's 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 an it's natural to do this. We do this, attorneys do this, doctors do this. But here's the thing. This is the reality. You're so much more than that. 100%. You would limit yourself because you're looking for just that battery. You're not building a generator. That's crazy. External light says I recently put my Xbox in another room. I'm 23. I have to learn more and increase my abilities. Sounds like you're on the right path, my friend. That is the way to go. And, you know, seeking that external validation and look, instead of looking inward is going to cost you in the end. I think, uh, I agree with you. Uh, women, especially women in the workforce. So our relationships are very, very traditional in the fact that my wife stays at home. She runs my online business for me when I'm at my job. I have two other companies that I'm running. And it's interesting to me um, how many people that we associate with that both parents work. You know, both partners are at work all the time. And um, it's interesting also to me how their relationships are. I mean, their, their relationships, uh, they don't really spend that much time around each other. And and I'm just talking about just hanging loose, whatever it could be, just, just chilling, having sex, whatever you're going to do, watch a movie, anything, just kicking back. And, um, versus folks that live a more traditional lifestyle. And I think the system has rigged it that way. It seems like we're running out of time as a people. It seems like there's not enough time in the day for the average individual. They're too afraid to step outside of their comfort zone and, and, and seek that something better. And so, when guys come to this uh, conclusion of, okay, this is how I'm going to do this now and I'm going to change, they're still kind of stuck in that rut and they, they're still losing that time, that time's eroding. And I think that men that are caught in that system, it, they still are seeking that external validation from their jobs, just like you were saying earlier. Oh, okay, it's, they, it, vicious. it's vicious because the battery gets smaller and smaller. And we could go into this, but if you get into it, you know, you're losing the value uh, that they're giving you. In dollars it's evaporating your economic power and freedom is evaporating every day 
it's smaller and smaller. You have to seek it more and more. You have to work more and more. It's it's it's, it's horrible. But yeah, you're right. Sucks you down. I think most guys, you know, would do well to you know figure that one out. And you know, I'm not talking about guys that you know they have a they have a comfortable job, you know, and they don't necessarily identify with that. The job doesn't make or break who they are as men. But then again, they probably aren't seeking out you know, help for improving themselves or red pill theory, anything like that, because they pretty much are squared away. Yeah. You know, this is my woman here, Thor. And she says the ones that work, both men and women spend more time with their work wives or work husbands than their spouse. I have so many stories on this one. Too. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fact. And I have witnessed this as, as a power lineman, I've also managed contract crews and watched the folks that are in the designs and the uh, engineering folks. And those are pretty big cube farms. And um, it's just about a guarantee. And we used to take pools on it when uh, one of the, one of the gals would get a promotion into a new department. It was the clock started before the divorce. Uh, she'd be exposed to men that are higher power than her husband. And it would be on because she spent more time with them. They would go to conferences, this and that. And it's just, it is human nature, it's human nature at play. And, uh, Yes, choices are still involved, but you know, instincts and emotions are very powerful things. Have you, has, has anybody ever been exposed to the the cheating being revealed and finally being held accountable for it? And these words come out. I don't know. I just don't know what happened. It just happened. Well, <laughs> yeah, yep, that's, that's how it works, right? I don't know. It just happened. So, yeah, um, yeah those are very powerful things. And uh, in the work environment, I, I was very fortunate, Phil, in the power line industry because of the way the harnesses are constructed. It's very painful for a woman because of her uh, femurs are differently put into the hip bones. Mm -hmm. so, you know, hanging off those harnesses is extremely painful. A woman could do the work. So that's not an issue. But in my environment, because of that and the nature of being in those all the time, it's almost exclusively men. And it is even to this day. Uh, plus, you know, in, in power line work, if you look at these statistics, you know, we actually take more casualties and deaths than police and fire combined. That's in, that, I had no idea. Yeah. And didn't and you, you all yourself all went through an experience, right? Loggers go, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if you can see, but my hands are completely, the skin's been burned off 31 years ago. I, uh, I got hung up in 12,000 volts that flattened me for, I didn't want to be late coming home to work. I was a single dad at the time. And uh, so I took a shortcut and I was 27 days late. You had 12,000 volts pass through your body. Yeah. And it shredded the skin off of my hands and my face. I got a facelift the hard way. <laughs> and I got this crazy deformed finger out of it. But you wouldn't know. I was eventually recovered from it within a year or two. And, uh, you know, it took me about five years to dig out from under that financial hole. And, uh, you know, it's just stuff. I was still alive. I drew breath. Just wipe some dirt on it and got back in the game, right? Yeah. That's, that's, inc that's incredible. <laughs> it is a very dangerous. Now, it is getting better, thank God. Um, there's still some silliness we do, but, uh, you know, the power grid's a, a, a kind of an invisible deal. It's so convenient, and yet it is so necessary. Um, you know, even in our union clauses, we're not allowed to strike in any way, shape, or form. I mean, they they... The last time the power utility industry struck in 1953, they called the National Guard out and forced the guys to go to work. Whoa. So, you know, they don't mess around with that. You know, people's lives depend on it. So, um, and that's a male dominated industry. It, it, it is, it is not officially. You want to hear a funny story here in California? Yeah. yeah. They passed inclusion and diversity laws and they now call it cultural literacy. Whereas they use demographics to hire so that we match the local demographics, a big formula. It's not supposed to be a quota, but you know, it ends up being a quota based on demographics, the way local politics want it to be. And so interviews are passed out in a certain number to candidates based on that and qualifications. Hmm. They don't go by the highest first. They go by the demographic first. Okay. So what ends up happening is in the corporation that runs the utility, we end up with 60% women and, and, uh, and it's great. We got all that stuff, but unfortunately when we have 60% women, they're not actually doing anything but planning and designing and scheduling and, you know, regulation and things like that. So where, where does the actual 
thousands of men that put the grid together, where are they? Well, they all end up working as 1099 contractors that work through uh, female-owned corporations. <laughs> and, and then they don't, they're not officially employees. So that's how, that's how it's done. Um, you know, that's, that's all those rules. And that's uh, it's similar. You know, I own two construction companies here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and I've been in business since 1992 in this area. And I will tell you that when I started these businesses, it was 100% male-dominated. But in the last, like I would say, five years, yeah. you're starting to see more and more female contractors, more and more female construction mm -hmm. workers. Yeah. Um, and it's it's an interesting it's an interesting time for me to to view that. You know, um, personally, I have all men that work for me, and uh, that's pretty much how it is. But um, there's no opportunity, kind of like your profession, for the ladies. You know, um, it, it's never really was a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there really wasn't any, any offer, any opportunities, I guess you could say now clientele, that's another story for another day, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. But back to the workplace, Phil, I want to get back to Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Foster here. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hit it. Interesting because here, here's the thing as a man, Let's say he's alpha. He's in charge. He is leading that relationship. You know, it's his responsibility to protect her from herself and those environments where she's at risk because she's at work. She's going to be in, involved in that identity and wanting to do good. She's going to get promotion. It's fantastic. She's going to be exposed to men because there's always a bigger fish that's bigger and better than you. You know, she's a little sweet thing, man. And that, that, that sweet smell comes wafting around and guys are going to hang around. She can't help it. It's actually human. So you don't want her to say, I don't know. It just happened at a lunch meeting. You need to protect her from it. Mm. You need to arrange it. So what does that look like when you're leading? It looks like maybe you start a business and she helps with that business and she gains her career from that business and she's involved in it that way. Now that, that just minimizes her exposure. That doesn't take it away. She's going to work with clients and all those things. Mm. But in some of these corporations, she's forced to be with a man that's decent looking, smells good, appears to be alpha, eight to 12 hours a day, and you get, what, three waking hours with her and maybe a few sleeping hours? And maybe she gets overnights with this guy? Um, no. What do you think? Your responsibility is to protect her from that. And so where does that resistance come from then? How do you deal, if you want to, if we're going to go down that rabbit hole real quick, <laughs> guys that are in that position, how do they deal with that resistance? Like, hey, babe, you know, I, I respect your position at your company. Mm -hmm. You've been great there, but I'm looking at starting this venture. Mm -hmm. I really want you to help me build this. I want you to help me build this business. I want to do this with you. Mm -hmm. And she's resistant to it. Well, I love my job. I love mm -hmm. the out-of-town travel. I love, you know, the comp lunches. I love my paycheck. Yep. There's too much uncertainty there when we're starting our own business mm -hmm. and I have certainty over here. What do you say to that? Well, you know, that is going to be a challenge because you're going to not be able to just draw a boundary there. You're going to have to work it over time. You're going to have to present yourself as a man of such value that is on the rise that it's irresistible to her to want to ride with you. Mm. That is really the way you start a business. You make it successful. You make it attractive to her. Look, you know her better than anybody else. You know what attracted her. Hell, you were that guy once. What did you lose? Pick it back up. You need to do that. Now, if you want to really get into this, you should probably, once you vetted her and you're in that six to 18 months of dating her, you need to start looking for behaviors and traits that will lead you to a woman that's willing to marry you and to be uh be a good wife of course i have a list of such things if you want to hear a few let's of those hear, let's hear them let's hear them sure these are simple man these are ones that you should use after the honeymoon's off it's very simple i have what's called added values mm -hmm. i have some that are called added liabilities for obvious reasons yeah, right yeah. so let's just look at a couple you know does she look to herself for her own happiness these seem obvious but think about it if she's looking to you for all her happiness, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. She does have to be able to self-generate happiness. Does she like being in your presence? Generally, does she? 
Does she listen to you when you're talking without interruption or making rude comments? Guy, I'd be amazed at guys that put up with this crap and they think it's better than sliced bread. You know, in a great relationship that has this potential, that just doesn't really happen. They treat each other with respect in public. Mm. They say good things about each other. What about behind closed doors, though, when they're talking? Well, that's okay. That's a whole different animal, right? Yeah. It's not necessarily a debate, but it's open and say, you know, you could easily correct each other. You expect it because you make each other better that way. Mm. Right. Um, and of course, um, does she polite have manners? You know, does she do things with genuine desire to please you? Mm. Is she proud of you? I mean, those are amazing things, you know, uh, does she inherently know that your success is truly her success? These are questions you should be asking yourself constantly, especially after the honeymoon fade. Uh, does she believe in self-care, cleanliness, appearance, and health? Mm. These are big ones, right? Yeah, because does they she, sure do change over time. They do. Does she make learning a part of her self-improvement routine? Does she make an effort to keep herself organized and have a clean abode? Is she, this is the big one, is she the influencer amongst her friends and family? That's... That's and deep. I value if she is the influenced, that's an added liability. <laughs> Does she leave you alone when you're working and making a living for you too and providing for your future? Or does she constantly pester you with texts and phone calls and expect immediate response? That's an added liability. Mm. Does she that's, look, co that's costing you. It is. Does she look forward to having sex with you? Mm. Does she make the effort? When she's not in the mood. Those are values, believe it or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you could take it to the added liabilities when you're actually screening and you're trying to put this 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 um, union together. You know, is she unreleased, unreasonably demanding of your attention? We talked about that just recently. Mm. Is pleasing and pampering her to avoid her discomfort something that you find yourself doing? That's a big one, too. Guys do this and fall in the trap, and then they go, I don't know. I did everything right. She's happy, happy wife, happy life. No, 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 no. No, no. No, no, no. It's like this. No. Good wife makes for a great life. Yeah. <laughs> Is your relationship defined by how well you measure up to her expectations? Mm. Is she say you're constantly working on your relationship? None of this should enter. These are all you know added, added or added liabilities. Um is yeah, your is your relationship based on quid pro quo? Uh, that's not good. And if you're having sex less than twice a week after this honeymoon phase, you got a problem because sex is the glue that holds this thing together. Seriously. And does she make you do chore play? You're not in control. You don't have frame. So you're not even going to have a chance to sit there and talk her into a business at work. Not yes. at all. So that would like sweeping the floors. You sweep the floors. I'll give you a piece. Same, lines. <laughs> same with starfish sex. If she's not into it and you guys aren't having this passionate validational sex, you got an issue. Now, does it get old here and there? And there's, yeah, of course, but there's ways to fix that. And it's not that hard. And is your, is, does she view your relationship as a perpetual work in progress? We got to work on things. We got to, that's not how it should be. That's a liability that will put you in a bad spot in the future. Is she unorganized in her daily routine? Does she have friends that negatively influence her? If she is influenced and she needs girl time and does girl things, mm. I'm not talking about having coffee with the girls that are in alignment with her and she's the influence. I'm not talking about that. Look, I've seen this happen and I've had plenty of clients. What happens is you'll have a covey of gals. One of them gets a divorce and she is burning it up. Now, fear of missing out starts to spread amongst that group of friends. And they start talking the life and they start talking how bad each other's husbands are. And pretty soon there's five or six. And I witnessed this in a freaking neighborhood. All the women went insane and influenced each other, got divorced. And where are they now? They're all single and they have trouble finding men. And the guys are all remarried and it's a crazy deal. So being in influenced is a big deal. You need to, if you're leading the relationship, you'll go out of your way to find her good, solid friends and you'll screen them. And you can't just be overt about this. You need to slowly consult, find her couples that think alike, 
you know, if it's church, it is, if it's not, that's okay too. You can find these and you have to be social as a couple as well. As soon as you stop doing that work becomes her social outlet and you're on the back burner. So yeah, you know, if you don't do these things up front, what you talked about when she doesn't want to follow you and she's making these promotions at work, it's going to be a real challenge. Oh, yeah. um, it could be done. It can always be done, but it's going to be a very slow and conditional process that you have to prove yourself for her to want to join on. And when she does, it'll be great. Yeah, that's uh, and a lot of guys they get that confused too. You know, she's gonna fitness, she's gonna fitness test you. She's gonna poke at you a little bit to make sure you're still on point, especially if she's walking walking away from her career. Mm-hmm. A lot of guys they just expect this just to happen, mm-hmm. and um, I think that uh, a lot of guys would do themselves a good disservice to to think about some of those things that you just mentioned right there. How many assets and how many liabilities to the relationship? My wife had another comment for you, Thor. She said, Mary ladies should not have single or divorced friends. Yep. Yep. That's, that's, a, that's a fact. I actually have a statistic on that. I can read for you right here. Here is this. This is amazing. This one was done by, um, this is the Pew Research Center. And you can look this up. Divorce and uh, is divorce contagious? So here it is. If you have a friend any friend or family member that was divorced in the next five years, you're 75% more likely to divorce. Really? If you have a friend of a friend that is divorced in the next five years, you're 33% more likely to be divorced. Look it up. Pew research center is divorce contagious. <laughs> that isn't, that isn't oh, I don't have to, I don't have to, you know, guess at it. Here it is. Good yeah, question. By the way, Mrs. Foster. You know, it's uh, it's interesting to me, you know, when you deal with a long term relationship and, 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 and vetting your woman and, you know, along along that journey of that long term relationship, like you said, there's going to be a few dry spells here and there, but it's not the end of end of the world. No. You know, there's ways to correct that. Um, and I think that a lot of guys, they'll get discouraged, especially when they switch over to this this type of lifestyle, this type of thinking of, OK, I'm going to improve myself. I'm going to reassert my dominance into the relationship. And once they swallow that hippo, so to speak, and they figure out, okay, I'm the man again, I'm starting to lead things. She's, she's still testing me, but I'm leading. And then a little dry spot might come along in the relationship or some static will pop up and they start second guessing themselves, you know, and then they, they, they seek, they fall right back into that comfort and that, that's, I'm going to go ahead and say it, that, that beta mentality, so to speak, that, misunderstanding of, okay, this is just a spot. This isn't the end of the world. And a lot of guys as well, I feel, and this is my personal opinion, you know, when they start to convert and change who they are um, and what they're doing in their relationships, sometimes the woman won't go along with it. Yeah. You know, because she's been in control too long. And so a lot of the advice, and I've given this advice many, many times, you probably in you're probably going to not like it. You might like it, Thor. I tell them, I say, hey, if, if she's not willing to to follow your lead and do the things you want to do in this relationship, then she's got to go. You know, no. being comfortable with knowing where that front door is. Here, here's the thing. If asked if any one thing that you could have in this life, what would it be? It would be more time. Yeah. It's the only thing that's worth anything mm. here now. So, yes, if she's unwilling to go along, you made a mistake. Cut ties, move forward, take the garbage out. I'm with you, buddy. Okay. Absolutely. Now, if things are savable and that is your desire, it could be done. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't throw, I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm. You know, I'd dry it off first. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, um yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to sell. I mean, you don't have to destruct if you don't want to, but if it's something where you're, look, she'll make a choice. People all make choices. And if they make the choice not to ride on the back of your Harley, so be it. Guess what? There's younger and hotter and tighter. That's ready to jump on the back of my Harley. Let's and, go in the sidecar too. Yeah, let's go. Right. And, the, and yeah. that's the, and, and that's where I, I struggle with a lot of men that really have sold themselves so, themselves short. Thor is that they, when you start confronting them on these issues and you tell them, Hey, this is what it needs to be. Um, they, they balk at it. They, they can't understand 
that they are worth that much. Yeah. And you're absolutely right about the time. Uh, every every little grain of sand that falls through your hourglass is gone forever. I mean, it, it, it's you'll never get that time back. No, and, it's so important. It's something that I counsel with Phil. When, when we just talked about the ladies spending the time at work, you know, that's time you don't have with your husband forever. And here's the thing. I had a very close friend that I counseled and consulted with. He took a consultant job where he was gone seven days at a time. I got one day at home. Hmm. You know, he turned his marriage into a sexless marriage instantly. And guess what? After a year that, that does that time come back ever? No. Is it worth the pay? No, the juice is definitely not worth the squeeze on that one. <laughs> when he realized it, he went home and started squeezing that juice. Yeah, rapidly. So <laughs> yeah. And that's the beautiful thing, right? Is, you know, you can correct these issues well in advance. And if you're in a long-term relationship, you know, and if she will not, follow your lead, then you definitely need to decide. And that's why you kind of coach these, when you're coaching these gents, you give them an exit strategy, you help them set up an exit strategy because sometimes it's unrecon it's unreconcilable, you know, and unfortunately uh, in this day and age uh, with egos that are it, it completely inflated, you know, and I'm just going to go ahead and put it out there. A lot of women, they, that perceive themselves because of the external validation that you were mentioning earlier in the stream, perceive themselves as something so much greater than they really are. They bring zero value to the table. They bring the, the only thing they bring to the table is what they, they, they have between their legs because they really are not bringing any other piece of the puzzle to help you build. And, and, and that's an uncomfortable truth that a lot of guys are going to be like, gosh, man, I can't believe you'd say that. Uh, but the facts still remain. Uh, with the way things are so upside down, uh, men, I think would definitely do better for themselves to focus. Like we were talking about first on themselves and then building their legacy. And if she wants to join she, or, or not, she's got to go, you know, and moving and moving forward in long-term relationships, um, you know, over this past year, I mean, if you're comfortable speaking a little bit, you know, to, you, why don't you go ahead and share a little bit about what you've been through in your relationship and how you as a man, Thor, have conquered it and how you're going through it, you know, and how you're in it for the long haul, so to speak. Sure. On my current relationship, we've been together 30 years. And uh, I will say uh, this, when I dated 30 years ago and I dated a lot and she did too, it was different. It was today. There's this perception that dating is serial monogamy for some reason. Mm -hmm. It appears as such. It's what I'm hearing, but that's not how we dated. We dated to, find a husband or a wife. That was the purpose. That's what we were looking for. And as a single father raising very young children, it was very difficult to do that. And I met her in a, as it, you know, as happenstance, she lived next door to a coworker of my father's. And uh, we, we had a blind date. She had two young children and I had two young children. I mean, they're all like under five. And um, we both had primary custody. And the other spouses were not involved. And uh, this seemed like it worked, but then, you know, I'm a little too rough around the edges and I'm kind of a bull. And so I scared the shit out of her. And so I didn't see her for six months. And then she saw me at a social event. And when she saw the social proof that I had, then she kind of, we danced, you know, you know, country Western dances where they rub their pee pee on you and all that. And it was, that was it. That was the end of that. We were on the <laughs> And then there was a date after that. We're, you know, inseparable for about, <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes, right? That country. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else is it, right? You know? Right. <laughs> and so, so um, you know, a year and a half in, I married her in a ceremony that was just me and her with our children present. And I wrote our wedding vows. So it was, it was something that was really important to us because, we had agreed right up front that it was about us. And then it was about us raising our family. Our children did not come first. It was us because we both knew that if we came first, we offered the environment that allowed our children the most success in life. It wasn't me with hers. My children come first and your children come first. It wasn't that at all. And throughout those kids growing up, when, they, when her kids grew up, guess what they did on their own? They legally changed their last name to my last name. Impressive. That was pretty cool. They both did it when they turned 18. Uh, three boys and one girl. 
Uh, and so, you know, we did not have children together, but we blended the family and it worked extremely well. Uh, however, you know, as things go, I was very career focused and uh, yeah, I was climbing the corporate ladder and uh, I actually went to college and got a degree and became a, a, a PMP, which is a project management professional. It took me about five years of that and realized I looked around and said, man, this ain't me. <laughs> that was a mistake. But during that time, you know, I became very complicit in uh, my marriage. I got sick. I mean, it's no excuse. I uh, had a tooth infection that I had uh, developed a jaw infection and I overused antibiotics and it gave me colitis. And I lost a lot of weight, lost all the color of my hair. I looked pretty sickly. I thought it was stress. I took a demotion so that I, so I could recover. All of that in her mind over the course of 18 months was a complete loss of attraction mm. and a slow waning of sex death, right? Yeah. And then, you know, as things would happen, She's exposed to other men. Other things are happening. She doesn't know what's going on. She has a loss of purpose, or so she thinks. Depression sets in. Counselors give her bad advice. And upon the bad advice, I came home one day, and the moving company had taken her stuff, and she left. So, I mean, I went through a, po a process there, uh, looked at a few things, assessed myself, and I was on the road to recovery at that point. And I just did a scorched earth thing. And as it, uh, I mean, there's a lot of details behind this, but as it turned out, she eventually got very, very depressed. And we started dating again about five to six months later. And eventually I moved her back in and uh, I had gotten myself quite a bit in shape. I had a lot of female attention, some attention from females that were the younger, tighter, exact spitting image of her. I did not make her feel well. Um, I understand that, but it also gave her motivation too. And she knew me better than anybody else. So she actually had a large advantage. And also there was some remnants of the wife goggles still on. So that saved empire right there. Um, and then ever since then, we've had the absolute best relationship you can imagine. Uh, it's all about improving ourselves and improving uh, our experiences. Now it was going quite well. Um, if part of my red pilling happened way before then, it was really with the 48 laws of power and uh, reading that. But uh, as I started my fitness journey, I kind of became more red pilled. And do, during that process where we had a separation in our relationship and I experienced others and other experiences, it, uh, it told me what was more valuable. And uh, it also taught me a lot. And, and during that time, I read Rollo's book. It had only been out for like three months. And it's, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. And it kind of gave me some of the tools that I moved forward with. I wasn't angry about it. I kind of knew it and I just moved forward and it actually improved our relationship considerably. Mm. Uh, and she's, she's the best, man. She's very flexible. She understands her role. She loves her role. She likes the fulfillment. She likes her grandchildren, her children. She likes being my wife. And there's a lot of play that goes on back and forth between us. A lot of sexual play, a lot of innuendo, a lot of social interactions that occur in our lives. Unfortunately, I've had to curtail a lot of those things because unfortunately a car was thrown into her last June and her neck was broken and she's now quadriplegic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she is wheelchair bound and um, at this point she can walk a little bit. She just received stem cells last week, implants, and we're hoping for some good recovery there. And she has every indication she could recover 80 to 100 percent over the next course of two years so that's a good thing yeah. um, so we're working really hard she's quite emaciated right now she needs to gain her weight back um but that's that we'll do that you know um but it, it's it's been quite a challenge for her and uh the thing that's most frustrating for me i mean i've been flattened before injured severely and had to learn to deal with it but to watch a loved one that's in such severe pain and it has been crushed before your eyes. It's a real test on your emotional regulation for sure. Uh, and you realize immediately that your feelings really don't matter. I'm sorry, but they don't. You have actions to take, take the actions. That's the most important thing. Take the actions for your family. And uh, she's doing much better, uh, I think, mentally. It's a hard thing to adjust to having such a fit, healthy, fun life to losing nearly all of it. And uh, she's starting to get some sensations back. That's a really good thing. Unfortunately, when she gets sensations back, Phil, they all feel like pain. And that's mm -hmm. now. 
It's a good thing, but it's a bad thing. Imagine, you know, you start to get some sensations back in your legs or your or your privates, and it feels like pain. That sucks. Yeah. That means the nerves are reconnecting, right? Mm. Uh, she's fortunate as a C6, uh, C or a C5, C6 spinal cord injury. She has incomplete. Thank God. She has bladder and bowel control. Oh, thank God. Right. That gives her some dignity. Yes. Uh, that's really good. Yeah. She's got a fused neck and she has very little dysymmetry with it. You know, with the exception that she has to bend over quite a bit, but we're getting her straightened out and we're going to get her some physical therapy for that quite a bit we've been doing. So I'm fortunate. You can see the gym behind me. Yeah. I've been doing that gym a few days a week and I make her cry and I don't like doing that. You know, I don't but it needs to be done. Uh, so we're going to be okay. Our relationships is good. She helped me put together a 20 hour course on long-term relationship success principles behind it and how to actually uh, fix a dead bedroom, how to actually explore when you've lost, when you've lost the drive and you've lost and things are boring with a relationship. How do you get that back? We're quite experienced with that. You know, there are things you can do. You can explore BDSM. There are other alternatives you can explore. There's fantasies. There's dirty talk. There's lots of things you can do that really can spark that again. There's erotic hypnosis. There's many, many different things. You can learn shabari. It's amazing. And it's amazing that it works so well. Uh, you know, get fit again. Join a fitness club, you know. Enjoy those folks. Get social. There's so many things that can be done to save that boredom that people find themselves in. And I'd like to think she is definitely my right hand because we've counseled uh, oh, probably half a dozen couple. And I will start with the men because it's a men's thing for me. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, she ends up on the phone with one of these gals. It's an amazing thing, you know? Um, and I, it comes from all walks of life. I mean, from around the world, I've counseled guys from Europe to Japan, um, uh, that have some troubles with their LTR and want to do better. So she helped me put those 20 hours together. Unfortunately, I was right, headed for a release a week before she got hurt. Yeah. Well, I had to cancel that and I'm going to redo it. Uh, I'm going to be posting on my YouTube channel, which is RP Thor. And uh, I do have a small mastermind group where I, I, I feed out pieces of the course as well as I invite men to join it. Very reasonable. And this is also where I help men uh, re-socialize themselves. We got young guys that come on and we teach them red pill principles and then ask them to present in front of the group, mm. to develop social skills. And there's amazing things using the Socratic method. When we get these guys to teach red pill stuff, it's amazing. They pay it forward. And then it really sinks home and you watch them blossom. And so we love doing that. So that's been a real success. A very small group, just two dozen. Mm. But uh, that's open and available. And then uh, hopefully later in the year, uh, I will be having a book come out on principles of long-term relationship. And there'll be some companion um, content that will be available to go with it, which is going to be video lectures based Excellent. on the hours of research. And she helped me do it. So that's pretty amazing. And what was her experience finding out about the red pill? She didn't like it. It's very unflattering. She read Rolla's book three times. <laughs> she couldn't do any of it. She yeah. bought the series for each of our boys. Ex yeah, there you there you go. I mean, that's that's the thing about that book, man. I've got probably I'd say probably six or seven copies up on my bookshelf here, all the books, but I give them out. Mm -hmm. You know. As a matter of fact, I've given that book away to my daughter's boyfriend. <laughs> That's amazing because for a Christmas gift, I gave it to my daughter's husband. You know, and it's that it's, dude. That dude is literally a Chad. His name is Chad. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, if you're watching this, or if you if you're going to check this out later, all of. Uh, Thor's links are in the chat above and uh, definitely check him out in his mastermind group, all of the stuff that he has to offer. And uh, on your fitness journey, before we wrap up, you know, you've dialed yourself in with hormones. Um, obviously, that's a big component for you as well as for me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of a testosterone replacement therapy and getting guys uh, optimized. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, men being in the position they're in because of their hormones and they're lacking. Mm. And, um, would you agree with that sentiment that hormones are a big, big, big piece? Yes. Yeah. Uh, they are. I mean, we're under assault 
And uh, when I say assault, we're under environmental assault. We're assault with our food. It's all processed here in the West. It's a, uh, you know, it's a really difficult thing what we're facing here uh, as men. And here's the thing, as women, testosterone and estrogen is crucial to our, our thoughts, our brain. They're both neuroprotective. They're not neurodestructive. There's myths around the use of testosterone and, and, you know, and estrogen and there's, oh, steroidogenic, you know, and steroids. Well, guess what? Vitamin D3 is a steroid. You need it. You, you know, you need it. And most of us are deficient. So, it you know, you really need to understand what these things are. And, uh, you know, more than half of men do lose their testosterone and they're coming to as they age, you know, into their 40s and 50s. Uh, I was fortunate I didn't have to start hormone replacement until 53. But if I look back, I was probably suffering symptoms at 47 years old. Mm. Uh, and, and that's five years I don't get back, you see. Yes. Um, and for the women, I think the impacts can be just as severe and in some cases worse. Yes, they have 12 to 17 times less testosterone. You know, testosterone is actually produced in two places in our bodies, right? For men... It's produced in our testes and our adrenal glands. In a woman, it's only in their adrenal glands. So, you know, um, definitely when they are under this environmental assault and they're eating atrazine and glyphosate and, and they're getting extra estrogen, is it a wonder that 80% are 20 to 45 pounds overweight right now? Yeah. Do you know the average weight for an American female between 18 and 65. Now, five how, how much? It's, how, it's how 168 much? pounds. That's insane. 25 years ago, it was 122. Yeah. yeah I mean, so, it's, yeah, it's so it, it affects men in, in such a way. And it's been so stigmatized. But, you know, around the rest of the world, it's basically over the counter. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, Tess, I know. I, I saw your website that you do some uh, some uh, advocacy for hormone replacement. I do a little bit myself, but uh, I'll tell you what: it is life changing if you are in a spot where you have low testosterone, whether you're a man or you're a woman. Mm. It's something you s definitely want to look at. Um, and there are very good doctors out there that will help you. We're not talking super physiologic. I mean, I'm sure Phil. You've, you're, you're in great shape. You've been accused. All oh, the guys on the juice. Well, yeah. you know, I'm on bioidentical hormones for sure. Yeah. It's the same stuff that I had when I was 30. That's one thing I did when I realized how important this was. You know, I bought a complete blood panel for every one of my children when they turned 30. That's awesome. Why? Because, you know, we have these numbers that are averages that are generated now based on a, on a uh, population of people. They're 80% overweight, fat, and sick. Mm. And that's the average? Well, guess what? My kids are way better than that, and so am I. So I wanted their baselines drawn now. So if there's ever an issue as they age, they have something to go back on, Phil. So, yeah, I'm a little bit of a believer in that area for sure, just like you. Is it a shortcut? Hell no. <laughs> in fact, here's the mm. thing. You'll feel better, so you have to do more. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's a lot of guys. They look for that silver bullet. A lot of the ladies do as well, but you do have to put the work in the gym and in the kitchen. You know, it's a big thing. You know, unfortunately people have just let themselves completely go and, and, and it's, it's a sad reality. And I think that, um, you know, if you're a guy and you're an older guy, you know, you're, or you're, you're interested in any kind of things that Thor has to offer, you can find them at become durable.com and on Instagram at RP, excuse me, R.P.Thor, RP.Thor. Um, he's got his YouTube channel as well. And I just wanted you guys to really know that, um, you know, some of the things that he shared with us tonight, you can understand that, uh, he's an older gent and he's been, he's had quite a, quite a life, what he kind of went through with his wife and, and, and he's into teaching guys that it's savable to a point. And understand that it's up to you to put the work in. You have to reach to those that have that information. And Thor is one of those guys out there. I've been following him on Facebook for quite some time. And um, it's, an, it's an impressive thing to watch. And you got to understand that uh, there's no silver bullet out there. You're still going to have to correct the, the issues that you have inside of you, especially if you're coming to the new red pill side of things. 007 MIB says, gents, thank you both for sharing comments and personal stories. It's good to see real men share the real truths. 
And that is something right there that is that hits home to me. And that's one of the reasons why I like doing this, these live stories, because guys definitely are taking this information and it's quality. It's reality is what it is. Absolutely. It's important. It's important for guys to understand that there is a better way. You don't have to feel less than um, you're, you're created to be something great. You're, you're created to take from this world. And that's what the growth cast is all about to savagely take what you want from this world. And that's what I mean, savagely. It's never too late. Look, you could be months away from 60 and you can be what you want to be. And, and if you want, you can sit here and become a god amongst men, literally, if you want. Mm. You got to put the work in yourself. Nobody's coming to do it for you. But it's amazing when you do. It's a journey, not a destination. I like that. Become a god amongst men. <laughs> yeah, that's my Facebook model, becoming a god amongst men. <laughs> that is beautiful. That is beautiful. Take that to the bank, you guys. And that is the growth cast, the savage way to take what you want in health, wealth, and relationships. Thor, thank you so much for coming on this hey, evening. Guys. 